Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Orthodox Logos. My name is Ian Silver, and today I'm joined again by Deacon Philip. Thank you, Deacon, for being here. Thank you for having me, and hello, everyone. And if you guys didn't catch our last video, you can click the link in the description to hear us dive into a brief description of the old ritualist, old believers, um, and a little bit about Deacon Philip's background. Um, Deacon Philip is a deacon at the Russian Orthodox Church of the Nativity of Christ. It's an old right church in Erie, Pennsylvania, and he is also a lecturer at St. Tikhon's in Moscow, Russia. So that's um, a little bit about him, but like I said, click the link in the description, you'll be able to hear our last conversation. And we left off talking about uh, the Listovka, which is, you know, the I guess you could say, for lack of better terms, the Russian version of the Komploskini or the, the prayer rope. And I don't know, um, Deacon, you want to kind of dissect a little bit of the symbolism? I know you have a video on this, and like you said, it, it could be kind of a short explanation, but I'll probably have a few questions about it along the way. Yeah. And yeah, what's, its, sure. what's its importance? You know, why why that over the yeah. prayer rope? So j just first, first to start off with, I think it's important when we deal with the old, right, generally speaking, that we always remember that it's actually something that was done in Rus before a certain date right it's not it's not something that exists in a vacuum today and it's not connected to the past or whatever because a lot of times people will get this idea about the old ritualists and see it almost as some not novelty but almost like a like a niche right yeah something something just it, this is this is kind of you know popular now so i'll be i'll be into this for a while but but we have to really understand that this was just the normal way up until a certain point yeah. Um, so pre that's why I always try to make pre sure. pre period. Yeah. So I always try to make sure that we don't make this whole thing too big in the wrong way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's there. It's beautiful, but it's a preservation of something that always was there, so to speak. It's not. It's not some you know some uh, some new sect or whatever. So just I just thought you know yeah to to somehow make that clear. So when we speak about the list list of uh, the the prayer rope. Uh, as many of you have seen, it, it differs quite a lot from the from the Greek kombuski that you mentioned, right? Yeah. Um, people, so what I'll do is probably seen those a lot. These right here, you know. Yeah, and, and again, to start off with, the goal is the same. And that's to pray. Uh, so I think that's that's probably the first thing we need to explain, because uh, believe it or not, people often forget that this is actually for prayer. You know, they'll know all the symbols, they'll know what it means, how old it is, they, they'll have the most expensive ones, and then it will just hang there for years, you know, not being used. So yeah, that, that's the first thing. and foremost, Sym symbolism, prayer. Exactly. And symbolism um, is nothing without action. And then, it, you know, you can't have symbolism and because symbolism is ritualism in action, basically. Yeah. Well, ritualism and is symbolism in action, basically. Yeah. And I think we'll, we'll speak about this more, you know, further on in the show. Uh, so just start off with, you know, less of what it means. It means the latter, basically. Less, it's, it's its old Slavonic word, which means basically a ladder or steps. Um, and the whole idea is obviously that we are climbing towards heaven. We are climbing towards our salvation. And this is obviously, you can connect this with, you know, St. John of the Ladder uh, or any uh, other saint who spoke in this, again, symbolic way, right? It's not like yep. we're actually climbing ladders. Uh but, but in our spiritual life, that's what we're doing. So that's why this w resembles more a ladder probably than the Kombuskini. Yeah. Uh, if we are to be honest. Or steps. I, I actually prefer steps. I don't know why. It just feels more like, like steps to me in my hand. But ladder or steps. So that's what it is. And, and, and but another thing it's called is a spiritual sword. Um, again, a symbolic meaning of, you know, we're fighting the demons. Uh, obviously, we shouldn't. We shouldn't hit people or even demons with it. I suppose we should we should pray on it, right? Yeah. Um, but we're there's not, a lot be of beating people like it. Like uh, I've seen those memes of there's a lot of stuff with uh, memes like the Catholics using the rosary as an actual physical weapon, you know. And that's yeah. Not, yeah. It's a weapon of prayer. It's a weapon of prayer, and if we look, you know, in the Bible, there's a lot of language that speaks about prayer life in a military way, right? Mm -hmm. Church militant. You know, my, yes, exactly. My, my, my shield, you, you know, rod, sword, yep. you know, these, 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 these things. Uh, so I think, you know, the spiritual sword is a, is a cool, cool symbolic way. So this is used 
mostly for the Jesus prayer, um, which I think most of you know, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, or us, sinners, whatever, however you want to say it. But it, it can actually also be used to fulfill specific prayer roles given by a spiritual father, or uh, by there's specific roles given in our books, which for us, for instance, say, if you cannot attend Vespers, you pray seven of these, right? Because it's yeah. 700. Wow. So, 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 so this is somehow, uh, and you would do that on a normal Combuschini if it has a hundred uh, knots. So it's, you, you could do that as well. But this was always somehow always connected with the idea that, aha, you cannot attend services, you pray seven less of us, or 10 or 20, whatever the service is, and there's a chart. You're holding yourself you know, accountable a, because you weren't yes. able to attend for whatever reasons. But you have yeah. this. You can you can do this wherever you're at. Yeah. And if we're to be honest, there's always Vespers every day somewhere. So yeah. you could always you could always yeah. do Vespers on your lesson, right? Yeah. Um, obviously that's not happening. But but if you ever reach that, if anyone ever reaches that perfect level of prayer, you could do that. Where you have uh, the so you Vespers, could, the Vesperal services memorized. You mean? No, no. You do it. Uh, in, so the so yeah. the, the chart specifies that you do this instead of being at Vespers. Okay. So so this would be for monks who would leave in a who would live in seclusion. Yeah. And it would be for lay people who, for various reasons, couldn't attend Vespers matters because there's a chart for all these services. So you could do hours, you could do everything, and there's a certain amount that for you the have to do. Them, so it, do they typically come with that, or is that something that you can find online nowadays? How do you know the so the chart it, it's in the old Orthodox prayer book that you have. Okay. Uh, that they're yeah, they're sure. there in English. This is the third yeah. edition, and if people want to get this, I'll put yeah. a link. I've been incorporating it, Deacon. I do like it. Yeah. I really do like it. I think the language is a bit more uh, It's different than the one you're used to, I think, because I yeah. heard when we prayed the first time, your language is a bit different. You would say you, you would say thou. Um, yeah. you know, I'm not American or a native English speaker, so for me, like, I don't get involved in those debates. Like, as long as I understand it, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you have the chart there, and these charts would be in old, usually old Slavonic books. So like you would have the Psalter, because the Psalter was the center of spiritual life usually, and yeah. you would have these charts in there. Uh, so you could you could even pray this if you don't have a Psalter. So it would say like for one kafisma, do this amount of these prayers. So it's again, some people might think it's like rigorism or it's almost like uh, ritualism, but it's just really just like you said, holding yourself accountable. Yeah, uh, and having a sort of uh, trying to be disciplined, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, and what you know, these practices and rituals, or these prayers, when it comes to Listova, are things that make us feel connected. You know, it's a it's a pattern of behavior. So it's something that yeah. we incorporate. Everything in our life is is ritualistic at some point. You know, brushing your teeth, yeah. tying your shoes. So prayer should become one of those things that becomes a ritual, and it takes you to a higher a higher place. You know, exactly, exactly. So. Let's just get into what it exactly means, the various Perfect. parts. Yes, so we, we start here uh, at this flat, flat spot. And I, I used to say it's, it's like flat earth, but I don't yep. mean the flat. Yeah. We talked about <laughs> that last earth time. De Deacon Philip is not a flat earther, everybody. <laughs> but, but, the, but the idea is that you start at this. On the ground. This flat, on the ground, right? Before you start your ascent into heaven. Um, so that's the first symbolic meaning is that yep. we're starting on, 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 on flat ground, step zero. Then we have the 12 steps that come here. And would obviously, be the that's, apostles? Exactly. Okay. That would be the apostles. Okay. Uh, so that's a very simple one. Then you get 38, free eight here. Hmm. And that's that's one that most people don't know about. Uh, and that's apparently... That's, that's what I've been taught, that it's the weeks that Jesus Christ spent in the in the womb of the mother of God before okay. he was born. 38 weeks. Uh, yeah, that, that's what that's what I was taught. Uh, if that's scientific, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how many weeks a child is in the womb, uh, but that's what I was taught and read. This so could be another lo lowercase t tradition, right? Oh, definitely. All of yeah. these, all of these are very lower t traditions. Yeah. This is not in any way essential to your faith, to your prayer. This is just we're it's doing not dogmatic or, or canonical. No, no. If you disagree that this is 38 weeks, fine. You're not going to hell. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so 38 here. And then if you add these two big ones, it's 40. And, uh, and so obviously, there's a lot of 40 in, in scripture and in everything. Yeah. So I think that's rather clear. You have 40 days, 40 nights of Christ. You have 40 years in the desert for the Israelites and so forth. 
So that's a very clear one. Then the next one is very clear as well. 33, which is obviously the years Christ spent on earth. Ah, uh, see, I went straight to uh, Freemasonry. No, I'm just... I'm you kidding. did? <laughs> <laughs> the degrees of Freemasonry, no. Oh, I actually don't know those. Because, yeah. you know, as the saints say, we should read heretical books. Yeah, I don't know no. what you've been doing. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> no, my grandfather's a, a Freemason, and yeah, that I've had a lot of. I studied yeah. a lot of that stuff being in the occult, so that's. Uh, I'm glad yeah. that I'm glad you haven't. Glory to God. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank God. I won't. I I'll try to stay away. Please. Uh, so obviously, you have 33 years of Christ on Earth, and then you have 17 in the end here, uh, which again, not many people know is actually the 17 prophets of the Old Testament. Hmm. Um. So that's that. And that's not finished. That's not the end. Because you have six here in the end. Together with the three other big ones, that's Eight, nine. nine. So that's the nine ranks of angels that we have in the Orthodox Church. Hmm. And also and then, the, the number nine is a symbolic of the number of completion in in some in some ways i've, I've heard that nine yeah. symbolizes completion so maybe like as you go around it you know this you, is read, reading that. into it but you've completed it yeah it could be it could be definitely i mean who knows maybe and then the last one is obviously the four uh i don't even know how to call this in english flaps and that's the four gospels or what is the evangelists. russian word for that lapovki lapovki maybe yeah is maybe it... i'm not sure actually because and like people don't speak like people want to speak about this way more in English. Interestingly enough, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. So I think it's yeah. So but I call them like I don't know flaps or whatever, and that's like the four gospels or the four evangelists that wrote the gospels. For the people, so that's who, basically, for the people who use it, they just use it. They don't have to talk about it. Like we're, yeah, we're interested yeah. because we have no idea what it is. Yeah, and, and and again, like you know, I'm sitting here and just explain the whole symbolism. But if you're not using it for prayer, it, it's it's pointless. You know, this yeah. is more like a like a cool thing to learn and it's cool that and it also shows us that way back in the day um you know things were a bit deeper perhaps right there was perhaps because people people you know people were not dumber they were just simpler right yes uh, so perhaps they needed some of these uh, some of these explanations to help them in their piety you know mm -hmm. because I, I i don't think people would speak about the uncreated light but they might know, for instance, that 33 was the years of Christ on earth. So in a way, it was to teach them as well. Like you could teach theology by this. You could you could put catechumens. And, you know, I just described all these symbols. Like he was in the womb. Why was he in the womb? Because God became man. And he was like, you know, like all of this could be tied into teaching someone about the faith. Yeah. And when it's done that way, it's a super nice tool, I think. Yeah. Like uh, even with, but, like but, you said, the apostles, the the angels, all yeah. the things that a lot of people, you know, might overlook. I mean, you, you 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 could do a, an hour lecture on all of these symbols separately. You could do about the ranks of the of angels. You could do about all the apostles, right? You can do about Christ's years on earth, like that he didn't show himself so much until he was like thirty, and, and then you can go mm. on about his preaching. So it's like this is not so much that you shouldn't think about this when you pray because in the Catholic Church they have the rosary and they'll have the mysteries and yeah. you have to meditate on them while you're praying. This is not the case at all. This is simply, you use it for Jesus' prayer uh, or for the prayer of the mother of God, if you wish, whatever. Uh, but it's not like you're thinking about any of these symbols. So that's very important, you know, just to explain to people that. It's, it's yeah, you're not, not getting, you're not getting wrapped up on. No, no. Like you're you, should, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be like, oh, now I'm on, I'm on, I'm the, on the apostles. Now. Yeah, no, you shouldn't do that. Definitely not. You know what it so means that, and you know what it symbolizes. But like you said, the main point of it is is for prayer. Yeah, and, and some people will probably even claim that maybe these explanations came later. I mean, you know, honestly, like, like I'm not going to sit here and say that, that you know, in the 12th century they came up with this. This might yeah. be, you know, it, during the polemics, after the reforms, the old believers maybe just came up with all this. Who knows? You know, I'm not – so, again, this is – But not even, this, symbolism happens because it just ended up working out like you have the 12, you have the 33, you have the 38. So there, there is some, some reason behind it. Yeah, I mean, they were – this was created – with that. these with these separations yeah. right so you would think that some of these like the 12 the 33 certainly were connected to but like the nine ranks of angels i'm not sure maybe like mm -hmm. i found out about that one later so it could be but but it's like again it's not in any way a, a tradition that you have to know or 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 anything you have to you know I don't know off the top of my head, and we don't have to get into this, but I don't know the nine ranks. I know there's the cherubim, the seraphim, and the archangels, right? Those are three. I don't yeah. know. Is there? I don't understand the others. 
yeah, I, I'm very bad at that as well. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, you you should actually perhaps do a, a show like with with with, uh, with Peugeot. That's that, that's how I'm saying it. Yeah. He probably knows all of them. Yeah. Um. So that would be nice. Because yeah, we talk about the cherubim and the seraphim all the time, and we see the archangels on the Okanastasis. Yeah. But yeah, that leaves six that I don't that I don't know about. And I bet if I heard them, I would be like, okay, I've heard that. Before. I mean, we have them in the in the liturgy. There's some silent prayers that speak about them, like winged beings, six winged. Yeah, six, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but but honestly, like, if you told me them, I would probably say, oh yeah, I knew that, but but I've heard of that. Yeah. But I've never, you know, I I studied theology for a long time, and I never, you know. I never, nobody taught me that, sadly. So I should probably read up on all the ranks of the angels. That would be nice. It. Okay, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, archangels, yeah. powers, virtues, principalities, and angels is what I'm singing. And this seems to be an Orthodox website. I could be wrong, so I'd have to do more research. But yeah, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, archangels, powers, virtues, principalities, and angels. That seems like a little vague, but maybe that is it. But yeah, you're right. That's that's definitely a good idea for a stream. And maybe if anybody knows, they can comment. They can. Yeah. But um, so that, I, that, 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 that's a cool, that's a cool, cool thing. Yeah. So I I was reading a little bit. I've been reading this thesis. I'm not sure exactly who it's by. I'm not sure if he's Orthodox, but it's on the old believers and the old ritualist. And it seemed it didn't seem, um like to attack them. It kind of was like a defense for, for, you know, where, where, where did you find it? Um, let me see if I can pull it up. I wish I was trying to figure out how to screen share, um, on my last video and it wouldn't let me, let's see, I'm pulling it up right now and I'll give you the title of it. Cause I know you also wrote a thesis, but it's definitely, it's not yours. Okay. Because yeah, I was like thinking, what, what if it's mine? That would be kind of funny. The Theology of Ritual and the Russian Old Rite, The Art of Christian Living, submitted by Robert William Bhutan to the University of Exeter as a thesis for the degree of master's by research in theology and religion. Mm. Um, and it was it was good. I mean, it, it's like 174 pages. And it made me, it started, I started having questions about this. Like, what is the Tipicon? Is that just a way of, is it, is it a way of life? I... Uh, no, no. So the Tipicon is the the book or the books that 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 regulate how the services are to be conducted. Okay. So, so for instance, you would have like uh, back in the days, you would have various Tipicons. Yeah. And then with time, it shrunk down. So you would have, for instance, there were like the Aphanite Tipicon today. Okay. Uh, or like back in the days, you would have the Jerusalem Tipicon. And Tipicon just means the order of services. So in it, you would have Okay, like today is, I don't know what, what day, it's, it's the, it's the 12th. It's the 12th. Yeah. So you would, you would look there. What do you do on this feast day during Vespers? And it would yeah. explain in detail, right? Which saint are you um, commemorating? What hymns are you singing? Yes, exactly. Like which tones, which, which, which all, okay. all the moving parts would be determined by the Tipicon. Everything would be determined by the Tipicon. So, so the Tipicon is just the order of, of services. And I always understood it as only being about, um mostly about the the services in church um so i i don't know how much of how you should live is in there certainly some parts like how you would behave the trapeza or like i know in our typical which is called the the eye of the church the one that the old ritualists use and it's like probably from the 11th or 12th century and it's one that came from malfatus i'm sure of that like Derry would say, like you know, if the breadwinner are falling asleep, the abba should hit them with a stick so they wake up. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you would have stuff like that. So should, certainly, it would speak about like these things that are not strictly about the services, but it would yeah. it would always be connected. Like it would say, like when you should have the meal before liturgy and stuff. Like so, yeah. Because this one, if you don't mind, can I read a bit of it? Uh, yeah, sure. I, this, I have all the time. This is oh. um, can, it says typicon as a way of life, and it says. In the pre-Niconian period, books establishing the rules and rituals of the church, like we mentioned, and daily orthopraxis were commonly were common and have been faithfully preserved amongst the old believers, who even in the late 17th and 18th century had disproportionately high levels of literacy in comparison with the general population. These texts, ranging from typicons intended for daily use and collection of church canons to more pietistic instructional works, codified ritual practice and piety. 
despite the circulation of the overly legalistic text, Fedotov, I don't know if you know who that is, mm -hmm. refers to as the bad Namok canons. On the whole, these books were intended to provide the foundation for proper and ordered Christian practice in the totality of daily circumstances, much like a monastic rule. They were source texts, as, if, as it were, for the art of Christian living. Extending, we want to argue the notion of the monastic typicon, or Ustav, to the life Ustav. of Ustav, to the life of the lay Christian. Something typical of the old rite, which tends to draw a less rigorous distinction between the clergy monastics and the laity. These old books are a testament to the love of ritual order and the dogmatic importance placed on orthodox rituality, which characterizes the old belief, and they are a window into the ancient rhythmic piety of orthodox Russia. So I felt like, I felt like he was definitely not defending, yeah, so, but he's admiring, you know, like why yeah. it's important. And, and he, he also mentions that, I mean, he, when he said typical, he also included, you know, works that would speak about, you know, everyday piety and stuff. Uh, so like an Ustav, uh, typical Ustav, basically means rule. Um, so so uh, in his assessment, and I think he did correctly, he included all of these works that are not only about services. And I, and I liked how he said that, you know, it, the, or the old belief, as he called it, want, wanted to or wants to, like the lines between a monastic and a lay person are very, you know, it's not, it's not such a big difference. Yeah. Um, at least it shouldn't be, obviously. I mean, come on. 2022 there is a difference right yeah uh, but 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 there i think the whole idea in russia in rus before the reforms especially from 1551 until the reforms in 1665 so like 115 years there was this idea that there shouldn't be any difference you know um and and, and, and like the society because it was even the terrible that called the council of 1551 hmm. and after that like apparently they just went all out and even like when Greeks would come to visit Moscow they would say that these Russians are crazy and they have legs of steel because like everyone like the Tsar would stand seven hours a day in church but that because that's what the Tipicon said like yeah. that's what it says that's what we we're doing right there wasn't and that's a very Russian uh, Slavic maybe we could say but particularly Russian trait is, is that you know when they do something they go all out like, people could no, say it's, like, it's rigorous but it's actually just tradition and it's a part of the ritual it's who they are it's embedded in them you know yes, yes it's a yes. form of piety I, but it's not like a prideful piety i mean sometimes i'm sure it can get it can get to that point but it's just who they are yeah yeah and, and, and i think that in other parts of the church what happened was at some point there was a decision made that look these people are working they're doing this and that like we can't force them you know to, to do come to seven hour, hour services videos. Yeah, we can't force them to go to five-hour vigils just to go to communion in the morning after. But in Russia, for some reason, before that, this was the case. And then after the reforms, you know, these people who were persecuted, they would just hold on to this fanatically, perhaps too much in many ways. But they would, you know, once you persecute someone, you show them that they're right. Right? I yep. mean, correct? I mean, that's that's, yep. that's that's the whole ethos of, of being persecuted. So once you persecuted them for their faith, what they thought were their faith, they would just go even deeper into this. Well, they, so, they so. called the Russian, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn did a speech. I can't think of the speech, but he talks about the free Russians and the Russians who were enslaved. And he was referring to the Russians who weren't allowed to practice their faith um, openly because of this distinction between, you know, the new way of doing things and then the old ritualist way. Yeah. You know, and saying, if, if we really were not worshiping a different God, so why... Why are we separating these people who, whether it's based on their, their lack of ability to read or just the way they were raised for hundreds of years, why are we separating them um, from the church, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's important to, to point out that to these people, it wasn't only about ritual. It was about a way of life. Like exactly. a, man should, a man should have a beard. A man should have short hair. A yeah. woman shouldn't cut her hair. Like it wasn't. And you know, and when and you know when Peter the Great came and he forced people to shave and stuff like that, like to the old believers, that was like the Antichrist is here, like he's telling us to shave. Yeah, it might sound simple, but they were just following what the scripture taught them and what the saints taught them, right? Uh, and, and, and so somehow it's 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 important to understand that that it, it, to these people it was so much more uh, than simply like how how do we do the sign on the cross? You know, like that was obviously important, but it was. The old belief, like I, I like that term, not because it's a different belief, 
but it really emphasizes that it's a whole system of living. It's a whole, it's a, it's a whole worldview, really. You know, and people nowadays yeah. kind of think of it as like this fringe group, and I mean, yeah. I guess in some in some respect, it is on the fringe because a lot of people don't. A lot of people here don't practice it. I'm sure if you go to if you if I was to come to Russia, how many um, listovskas listovkas would I see versus prayer ropes? Probably a lot, right? I mean, yeah, but you would still you would still it would still be outnumbered by the Greek prayer ropes. You know, the the the, the old ritualists are really on the fringe. Yeah, I mean, they would say they they have a few million people. You know, if we combine all those groups into one, uh, which is unfair to do because they're very different, but. So it's not it's it is a very small thing um, that that is very specific and and very very hard to penetrate. You know, it's very hard, uh, to, I think, to fully understand. And I'm not saying I understand it because I don't fully understand it because it, it's such a there's so many layers to it and there's so many various, um, I would say, living testimonies of it that are very different from each other. You, know, you have some people who are priestless. Who, who who are like from our point of view completely heretical because they reject the priesthood, the bishops, and everything, but they preserve like the best chanting and they preserve the best icons, right? So yeah. like if you want old Russian icons, they have them, but they're also like they're a bit wacky because they're like there's no church, basically, right? Yeah. Um, and then you have like the old ritualists like myself who are in the bosom of the church and and we're in full communion and we're we are the smallest group of them all. Like we're definitely the smallest group of, of all. Is your parish the term. only old right parish in the United States? Yes, there is one thirty minutes from us uh, that is that is newer established, but that's that's it's still very small. So I would say like there's one and a half parish. Wow, it, that is that is canonical. There's some you know, like we talked about the are, schismatic, where they yeah, have their and, own and, bishops and their own metropolitans. Yes, and... exactly. Yeah. So 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 I don't want to somehow talk too much about them. But yeah. but they do exist and and but you know it's also important you know the Russian Church in the last fifty years you know removed the anathemas against these people. It that's said what that, I, that's what I was reading. Yeah, yeah. It said that you know they are as long as they come back to the church they're orthodox. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to do all these things. So like the, the church, like the church, the Orthodox Church, has admitted that these people have preserved a lot of good things. Uh, but hmm. sadly, you know, have you, when you've been in skids for 350 years, it, I think it becomes a part of your identity, right? Yeah. And then it's like, well, we can't unite with these people because they killed our forefathers. And it's like, no, we didn't. Like, yeah. And you've had children. Those children have had children. Yeah. So, you know? so it's, it's exactly, exactly. And that's another so, thing. It's part of their tradition. It's part of that's their ritual now. And it's unfortunate yeah. that we all can't be in communion, but there's reasons. There's plenty of reasons for it, which we don't, we won't get into, yeah. you know? And really, like like this whole this whole notion of old belief, like it, it it is very important for me to to really highlight that we who are in the church, yes, we do things a little bit differently. But unless you are into liturgy, like you wouldn't see that many differences. You would see like the prostrations, obviously. You would see maybe how men and women are dressed a little bit differently. Mm. But apart from that, like if you're not trained and if you're not into it, you would just say that yeah, these guys are serious. But you wouldn't say it's a different thing, you know. Yeah, and that's important because because we still have more in common than we don't. Like we're not there's exactly. not this sea between us, you know. I mean, we're, I would commun say we're communing together. Exactly, exactly. So even though we get three spoons and, and you get one spoon, three. Sp wait, yeah, I, I just needed to because I, I I just forgot to say, say it in the last sec. So when when lay people commune in the old right, they get three spoons. So they get one with the body and twice with the blood. Really. Yeah, so if you have a whole church communing, it'll take three times as long because they don't get, get free spoons. Oh man, that's it. Why? Why is that? I mean, I, I've tried to find out. I, I'm obviously we clergy in the altar when we drink from the chalice, we do it three times. Yeah, I mean, so I, I understand think, so I, the three. I understand the symbolism of the Trinity. Or yeah, the three. So, yeah. So, 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 I think it's probably connected to the fact that way back everyone did that. And then, and then, you know, people were like, okay, we have 500 people commuting in a cathedral. If we give everyone free spoons, you know, so they did one. That's my guess. But again, you see, these things were never like, <coughs> excuse me, these things were never like talked about in ecumenical councils. Yeah. So like, so again, they're not important. They're that still important. receiving the body and blood of Christ. Exactly. And it's not like it's worth less because you do it once instead of three times. I just thought it was, a, I just wanted yeah, to throw it in there to and, shock and, you a little bit. Yeah. Well, you did. And they're not like 
handing it to us, you know, like we're not taking it ourselves. There's not stuff no. like that where we're handling the body and blood, you know, it's still being given but, to us by an ordained priest or, or deacon. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, so, yeah. So I want to kind of, I kind of like this article. If I can just read some little things from it, it, kinda, sure. it gives us some talking points and it was really interesting to me. I've been diving into it. So kind of going back to this, it says that in monasticism itself, the meaning of the Tipicon resides not merely in the liturgical book codifying the rules and rituals of the church, which bears this title, but in the very notion of an ordered life established by a particular monastery, and which has as its purpose not primarily the adherence to rules, but the cultivation of a harmonious life, a life of calm, of hesychia, for the brotherhood as a whole and for the individual monk. Broadly speaking, the meaning of Tipicon is to provide a framework, a structure, as it were, for freedom and the becoming of likeness. As Archimandrite Vasilios explains, this framework, this order and tolerance, which provides possibilities for personal particularity, for each to achieve consciously his personal maturity and stillness, for him to be able to find himself, to find his own rhythm, and to say, Lord, have mercy consciously, to pronounce one word that comes from him personally, to speak his own language, and so to communicate with the one word who is imparted through the words of our people and created things. This framework, this world, this environment is prepared by the Tipicon of the Church, a structure crafted from life, an ordered resume, uh, regim regime and created things, which has room for each person with his own name and at every stage of his life and his journey towards maturity. It is not a rigid mold which produces identical artifacts, but a living womb which creates personal beings with their own character, calling, and destiny. So I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, it's like it's it's a set of ways to do things, but it's going to be different for everybody depending on where you're at in life. Yeah, and, and, and depending on where you're at in life, but even depending which monastery you're at. And I think he mentioned that in the beginning that, yeah. you know, different monasteries would have different ones. Like, like there were monasteries up in the Russian north which would allow fish during Great Lent. Why? Because everything was frozen and all they could find by the sea was fish. They didn't have vegetables. So in their typical, you would, it would be like, well, you can have fish three times a week during Great Lent. If you say that to Greeks, it would be like, you're crazy. You yeah. know? So it's like, so so that I, I like how, how we explained it, that it's, I mean, it's a rule, but it's also quite flexible, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a framework. I think exactly. that's what you wrote. Yeah, it's a framework. I mean, we see I even see that in the Greek church depending on depending on where you're at. Like like once again, lowercase lowercase t with these with these things, you know. It's not you can, necessarily it, salvific whether, no, no, whether no. or not. And, and you could ask your priest, like, you know, what you know, can I see the TP code? Like which TP code are you using? Like what, what are you yeah. following? And he'll he'll usually have some answer. Like he my might wife tell you, like, has a his blessing. bishop taught him, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. My wife has a blessing to eat uh, eggs, period, period. Yeah. because she will lose weight. She's already very, very skinny. She needs, like, she has a blessing, and trust me, that's um, that's a rough one for me when she's, you know, got a nice omelet and I'm eating beans, you know? But yeah. it, our spiritual life is different. Our body is different. Our, our Your spiritual father knows what you need or what you, yeah. what you can do. Yeah, no, I, that's, you're definitely right. So, so yeah, the Tipicon is, it's important, uh, especially to the old ritualists, but, but generally it is important because it gives, it, it, it defends the church from anarchy, liturgical anarchy, right? It defends the church from every priest doing whatever he wants. Yeah. Um, so, so there, there's a reason why it exists, um, uh, but it has to be approached and used in the correct way, I think. Yeah, and, and that, that makes believers sense. will follow it to the to the point, while others won't. But as long as you try to follow it, as long as you're not doing whatever you want, well, that's what that's, that's what we uh, see has happened now. And this kind of kind of goes into the next thing I was I was thinking about is without these rituals and these traditions, whether they be small T or big T traditions, we see in the West especially um, like the non denominational churches trying to remove any form of tradition or or ritualism like at all and they're left with with like um this emptiness when you when you go to their church you know you see that they want to remove ritualism but they can't quite because they still sing but they're not singing the hymns that we sing they still worship but they're not worshiping the way 
we see, like you said, in the, in the books of services, you know, they're removing things to make it easier, to make it more convenient. And with the old right and even Orthodox in general, um, our services aren't necessarily and usually about convenience. You know, worship shouldn't be convenient for us. It should be, you should stand there and you should feel uncomfortable and you should look inwardly and realize what you've been doing, you know? Yeah, you're completely correct. And, and, and I think we spoke about this the last time, even about chanting, right? That there's some tendency in churches today, in Orthodox churches, to make the chant too pleasant. It's almost like an, like an operatic concert, right? And you're, you're almost teared up because it's so beautiful. And like, but at the end of the day, if you ask yourself, did I pray? No, I didn't. I, I listened to a concert. And I think, and I think, like in the old Russian tradition, you would have the Slamenny chant. It's very dry by today's standards. It's kind of similar to the Byzantine one, but probably even more dry. And it's like, but when you listen to it, like it, it, it it's like a priest told me, like it, it's almost like it causes violence to you because it's like, it, like, it's like forces you to pray. It's painful. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's painful at first, and it's almost like you're not allowed to do anything else than pray. And this chant reminds you of that. But once you get into it. Like it will open your spiritual eye to dimensions that you haven't seen before, because it's like according to tradition, the angels sing in this sort of way, like they do in the Byzantine chant on Mount Athos, right? Or these amended chant of the old believers, which is very similar. Same, it's based on same principles. Once your soul gets adjusted to that, it is not about having these emotions and and goosebumps and crying because this woman is singing "Our Father" beautifully, right? Yeah. But it's about something deeper. Uh, and once, which which and isn't once always it, bad if you can find a balance between the beauty and still being yeah. able to pray. But like, if you're getting distracted by just like, oh, this is beautiful, and you haven't said a prayer or you're not yeah. connected, you're not in communion. But I mean, but I mean, you you've heard Greek chat. It's beautiful. Yeah. Like it, yeah. Even though it is it is much more rigid and spiritual in its in its in its more archaic forms, it's still like it's wonderful to listen to. Yeah. Um, because because it it is there is some dimension to it that it's, it's heavenly you know it's it, it's it's come it comes from 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 the experience of the church where we're where like we're to imitate the angels yeah and that's what's odd about yeah. the, the non-denominational churches like trying to remove these rituals and these traditions it's then you see them like struggling to find tr struggling to find anything um to bring them they're like we need, now we need guitars you know, now we need we need fog machines because we need more. We need more. But really, it's like we could just go go back and yeah. see how things are done. And, and you're not you don't have to search. You don't have to search for anything. It's all it's all right there. And and, and you get this testimony from Protestants that convert yeah. so often. They'll be like, oh, you know, I thought all of this was made up in the Orthodox Church. Blah, blah, blah. Then I started reading the Bible you know, as a Protestant, something they should have been doing. But it's like all of this, these parts of the services are like in the Old Testament. Yeah. Like like this curtain, oh wow, it's this curtain, like incense, oh wow, like yeah, like all these small things. And when it hits them, it's like, wow, I'm actually in the church that existed, you know, three thousand years before Christ, even, right? Yeah, before that's the what Bible. Claim. Before I mean, the Bible. Exactly. I, I think I think one of the biggest mistakes Christians make today is like, oh, you know, we we've existed since Christ's resurrection. Well, that's that's in a way true, right? Yes. In this form, but our worship goes back three thousand years before that, even to yeah. the time of, of the old, even before the Old Testament. Uh, so, so exactly, so our it, God is the God of the created and the uncreated. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying we're the same as Jews because Jews today is that are, are not the Jews of of three thousand yeah. years ago. That's also important, right? But it's 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 just this idea. Like, don't get fooled by this notion that you know that this started with Christ. Christ was the fulfillment of the law, as he said. Right. He came Testament. to fulfill exactly. So we are just a living continuation of that church that existed always. Yeah. Before Christ, or always, you know what I mean. Long oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. So how do you think, I mean, as as someone who is an old ritualist, what practices for you, practices and rituals make you feel connected um, on a daily level? And how, how important do you think that is as Orthodox Christians, you know? You mean what specific practices help yeah. me? Do you, do you have any like specific practices that, that you do that you can share that make you feel connected to the old ritualists? I mean, the Listovka is probably one of them. Yeah. But that, but you could do that with any prayer room. Yeah. Right? So, so, so I, I think that once we talk, start to talk about these things, like I would just tell you that 
it, the things that affect me would be the same ones that affect you and other Christians, Orthodox Christians, regardless of their ritual. Because at the end of the day, like if you can pray to Jesus prayer for 20 minutes in a day, that's a miracle, right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you do it on a less of God or the rope like you have. But if there's one thing that, that, I, that I think is more prevalent in the old right that helps me a lot, is is the prostrations oh the so, entrance bows deacon those yeah. those are amazing yeah because they set the tone right you come yeah. you stop you yep. make free bows like it's not it's not this like oh i'm in church now it's like you really uh yeah. but i think it was saint paisius that told his spiritual children like never pray without prostrations and he was an athenite monk who died in the 90s and in the old ritual this is still very much alive and as you know in the book it's very clearly says even when to do it um, and if you go to the charts, it will say like you can pray the Jesus prayer with these prostrations. Yeah. So you can do a hundred. Yeah. So if, if if there's one thing that I think the old right, it's not exclusive to the old right, but it's something that is perhaps perhaps better preserved than the old right is just the usage of prostrations. And I know they help me. Like if you're hungry and you're fasting, if you make twenty prostrations, I promise you, you're not hungry anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean, like your back will hurt or well, your knee. Like yeah, you, that's why people work out. That's that's what it is, and yeah. this is spiritual workout. Because if you do the prostrations while while you're saying the Jesus prayer, uh, it all comes together, right? Like yeah. you're, you're saying it with your mouth, you're feeling it in your heart, mind, mind body, and soul, it. everything. A exactly. Prayer, prayer yeah. is supposed to be with your whole being. Yes. You know? Yes. So, it's not just so. asking God for things like, "Oh God, I, I need a new car." You know, it's it's a connection between your mind, body, and soul. Yeah. So, so while I want, just want to make it clear, I know a lot of Christian or Orthodox Christians who are not old ritualists. I know they do prostrations, uh, and that's yeah. wonderful. We should all do them. But I think that in the old right, there's just a, a bit more of them, and they're more visible probably. And that's one of the things that 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 for me means a lot. Because oh, I mean, any time like, I struggle, if, if I someone do... was to look at this book, look at that prostration, yeah, prostration, 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 prostration. Yeah. You know, yeah. it just it and makes again, sense and, too. Yeah, and it's very orderly because it says black or white. Again, you can do them however you want. Like, yeah, you know, I I know people who will struggle with something with a sin, a sexual sin, even, and they'll go in front of the icons and just do a hundred prostrations just to just to kill their body and you know, just to kill their lust, right? Yeah, and it will help them because it is really a tool. And and even if you look at other other world religions, even though I hate that word. Yeah, the prostrations are prevalent in, even in ancient, ancient Muslim. times because people, yes, because people understood like I'm submitting to something higher, and also I am, I am, I'm, I'm regaining control of my body. I'm telling yeah. everybody, stop! I'm the boss, right? Yeah, you won't tell me what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Exactly. Um, so it's it's an ancient pious practice that I think we we as Orthodox must preserve because Catholics have lost it, sadly. Yeah, and we we have to preserve it. In, and if you in, do a prostration in a calvinist church they're going to think you're in they're going to think you're muslim or insane you know oh, yeah. <laughs> insane one of the two but yeah for, for sure for sure i think it's really important i have um i haven't been doing it i mean i just got the book recently but i'm the first person to show up for vespers with with my father and i'm the first person to show up for matins and stuff so it's just me lighting the candles doing all the things and now i realize how important it is first thing instead of getting to the church and turning on uh, the iPads for the services or, or lighting the candles. The first thing I should do is I should show reverence. I should, I should do some prostrations. I should say some prayers before the icon of Christ. And then I can go about doing my things. It just makes, um, you know, it's all about being connected and being in alignment with and direct communion with God. And I think it gives you an opportunity to humble yourself before God. Yeah. You know? and, and, just, and, and just a quick advice to our Orthodox, you know, sisters and brothers who are listening um, you know, if you go to a church where they are not making prostrations, you know, perhaps don't start to make prostrations because that just that that will just be odd. Yeah. Do it at home when you pray. Don't even it, tell anyone. Yeah. About it. it makes you look overly pious, even... too. It can make yes. people feel bad yes. about so, themselves. Yes. So if, if, it, if it's not part of your local parish, if it's not part of the tradition you're following in a church, that's fine. Like all the saints speak about frustrations, just do them at home. It's even yeah. better because then you, you won't feel proud of yourself. You just yeah. you do them a, alone. So so it's just important to point out if your church do, does them, then do them. But if if they don't, just just make sure that you do them. You know, as it says in the Bible, you know, close the door when you pray, right, in your own room. Do yeah. do it there, right? 
Yeah, I was listening to a story. Um, I'm not sure if you're on uh, Telegram, Deacon Philip, but there's a Telegram group called I Athen- Athenai yeah. Audio. Um, and he like reads books. And there was a story yesterday I was listening to. I think it was Father Arsenios, or it might have been St. Paisios, but um, he was doing prostrations and doing the prayers. And he would do, you know, however many it was, prayers and prostrations. And he would lay down, and the devil would come to him and say, get up and do more. You know, how, how could you lay down right now when um, Martha is sick with heart problems? Get up and do more prostrations. And his pride was like skyrocketing. skyrocketing. So he went to his, his Yeronda and asked him, and his Yeronda said, do 10 of these and do 10 of these and do not do any more. You know, and it, it kind of like helped him kill that pridefulness because people can think like, oh, I did 100 prostrations. I feel really good. I feel great. That's not the point of it, you know, because then you're giving no. glory, glory to the evil one. You got to yeah. follow what your spiritual father says, first of all. But I thought the story was amazing. You know, the devil was saying, how dare you lay down? He would do more, lay down again, and he'd come again and say, you need to do more prostrations. Yeah. And, and that's why, and that's why, you know, we who are old ritualists would say, that's why it's so clearly specified in the how book many where and to where. do it. So that, so that you don't get an idea that you should yourself decide, right? Yeah. Uh, and especially if, if you don't have a spiritual father, get that book. If you're interested in doing prostrations, because there's there's explanations when when to do them and stuff like that, and just follow that, because then you're following at least something ancient, something that is blessed. Yeah, it is. Uh, exactly. And if you have a spiritual father, if, and if you have a spiritual father, just ask him, and he'll tell you, you know, do ten every time you pray. Yeah. For instance, right? Yeah. Just don't overdo it. But I think this whole overdoing it, it's it, it, it. We always have to have a balance, you know. We always have to. We always have to have a balance, and then. And boy, do we know about that. You know, we have, we have some people who are interested, you know, they come to our church and it's like, oh, your vision is four and a half hours. That's wonderful, right? And they'll just, they just burn out because it's like, you know, four and a half hours, if you're not used to it. That's a it's long hard. time. And yes. And it's hard. I mean, it's it's hard for us. We're used to it. You know, some some vigils are five hours because it's a big feast. You know, on Pascha, I mean, we're in church like 17 hours that day. Like, I'm not even joking. And it's like, it's not, I'm not saying that to be prideful, but it's just important that we recognize our, our own limitations. And if you come yeah. to a church for the first time, like don't expect yourself to stand up for four and a half hours. Sit down. Like, you know, admit sometimes it's better to take a break. You can push you can push yourself to whatever you whatever you know is comfortable, but not to a, the point of pridefulness. Because that's what happens. And yeah. then people just stand and they don't even pray, but I stood for four and a half hours. But what did you do during those four and a half hours? Well, I thought about did how I was standing video? for four and a half hours. Yeah. Or did you did you solve puzzles in a video game at home? Did you did you prepare, you know, did you do yeah. things in your mind that you shouldn't like? Because that's that's a danger with long services as well. Especially yeah. in our day day and age. I mean, I think we spoke about it last time. We can't even be quiet for five minutes. You know? Like yeah. like it's it's we, we're just uncomfortable with being quiet, with being still. That's why uh, when I found orthodoxy, like having the morning and the evening prayer rule, if that's all you do, you at least are able to stand before the icons for five minutes, for two minutes in the morning and the evening, and you get a sense of stillness and you start to, the more you get into it, the more you realize like how important uh, silence and, and stillness really is to your spiritual life, you know, because you can do a, tons of reading and tons of talking. And you can you can go to all the services too, which I recommend. But stillness is is super important. It's something I'm I struggle with a lot, you know, because I always I'm always doing something. I'm always moving, always working, and you know. Yeah. But I find but I, peace I, I, when I'm still. Yeah, and I think Abbot Trifon is that how you say his name? Yeah, Tri- Trifon. Yeah. Yeah, I think a few years ago he posted a, a great recommendation, like for people that like you just described about yourself. Like sometimes it's enough to just light light a candle in front of your eye and just be quiet for fifteen minutes. Yeah. You know, some sometimes that will be your evening prayer. Yeah. Sometimes that will be your offering to God because maybe you're just too weak to do the rule. But also sometimes I think we forget to listen to God, and when we ramble all these prayers for such a long time, you know, like you know the prayer book you have now, like it takes yeah. probably half an hour to do the morning prayers. Yeah. And and you do them, and then you'll be like, did I even listen? Like did I give? got a chance to respond like i'm not saying respond in real voice you know what i mean but yeah but it's in silence and, and still that that we find god right well yeah so, exactly so, yeah that's uh that's really important yeah you can you can do all the prayer you can say all the prayers you want but are you are you actually saying the prayers are you you know are you listening 
as well. Yeah, I, I read I read a story about, or no, this was told to me about a monk who, uh, uh, I think maybe I told you this thing. No, I did. I told you about a different monk. So there was a monk who, you know, he would go to the spiritual father uh, every week for confession. He would just cry. He would cry that, you know, he, 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 he couldn't keep his prayer rule, right? And he would consider himself as the worst sinner and like he just couldn't. And then when he died, his body just wouldn't decompose and he smelled like roses, right? Because it was clear he was a saint because he knew his weaknesses. He admitted his, he admitted his weaknesses. He knew he was a sinner, right? And you he see, knew he, he wasn't do doing his, his prayer role correctly. Or, or he, he he said to his spirit, I never fulfilled it in my life because it's too hard, right? It's, that's how weak he was. But because he was so humble, when he died, the other brethren in the monastery witnessed that this man was a saint, you know? Wow. And, and, and this might be like a myth. I don't know. But I was so by myself that this is what happened. And there's apparently thousands of such saints that we don't yeah. know about, you know, who died peacefully in Malfatas or anywhere. And you just don't know because why would you know, right? And even if it is a myth, it still represents a reality. You know, it's oh, yeah. it's still a true story, even if it's if it's a myth. That's the the thing that yeah. people people don't understand about myths. It's it connects sure. you to, it connects you to something that is true. Yeah, and whether and or not even, that I, specific story is true, I guarantee there yeah. is one that is. Oh, for sure, for sure. And this whole idea that we have to repent and we have to understand our our own weaknesses. Yeah, it summarized in this story a Greek metropolitan told me. He said that a woman came to confession, right, to him, and she's like, like you know, confessing half an hour, right? <laughs> Greek style on Pascha, half an hour, she's just talking. And throughout all the confession, all she talks about is her husband and all the bad things he does, right? So I've he heard one similar Jesus. about like, yeah, talking about her sister yeah. or whatever, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then she stops and she's like, okay, so and then he tells her, okay, well, now your your husband can come to communion <laughs> and, you, you, and you come back when you repent. You know, because she didn't understand that she has to, she has to repent of her sin. Instead, yeah. she was talking about her husband. He was like, "You confessed instead of him. He can you, take communion. Yeah. You, you confessed can't. all your husband's sins." Exactly, exactly. And this goes back to the idea that I think once we understand how, how, how it's not about putting putting ourselves down or being negative, right? It's not about this being depressed or whatever. It's just yeah. about realizing that that we have such a long way to go. Well, it's a joyful uh, sorrow, about, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's it's hard to reach. You know, it's hard to reach because pride yeah. will come like in a second. Like pride will just oh, poof, yeah. you know. And then when you think you're here, like the next day, you'll probably fall very well, hard. That, that's the thing. Like, you complete your prayer rule finally, and you're like, oh yes, oh yeah, done. <laughs> oh, that's you're, you're already fallen. You've already fallen. Yep. Right? As soon as you thought that, you're like, oh, I did so good tonight on my prayers. The evil one's like, yeah, you like that, yeah. don't you? Oh, I even did some prostrations, and it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Tell your spiritual father that he's going to say, "Okay, no more prostrations for you." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? No, no, for sure. But that's but, why we always need to be guided. Try to be guided. It's hard because there's not a lot of. Spiritual it's a weird balance, around. isn't it? Like you, you're instructed to do your prayer rule, but then if if you do it and you do it out of pride, then you haven't even done it. Yeah, but that's why that's why you know in some traditions, like in some monasteries in Russia, the monks are instructed to confess daily. So yeah. they're instructed to go to their to their abbot daily. And tell them all of their faults and all of their sins for every day. I don't know if he gives them absolution every day, but sit down and tell him, what have you been struggling with today? What did you think? And this, I think that's important because he can he can adjust their rules. He can adjust their, like the Philo Kali, you know, people read it left and right. It should be read in such a way that your abbot should give you as a monk a specific part to read yeah. that corresponds to your problem. Right? That is definitely a book, a book in general that you should get a blessing to read. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but even if you get, like, I don't think it should be read from beginning to end. No. It, it's really, it's really, it should be used as a medicine. Exactly. And, and abbots and spiritual fathers. Here's your prescription. Here, read these pages because he speaks about your problem. But yeah. your problem is not my problem, right? Like, like a mother, like I know, I knew a woman, free, free, a mother of three. And she was, she was trying to read a philatelia. And she came to me, she's like, father... You know, I'm trying to read this book, and like it says to eat nothing, and I'm like, I have three kids. I'm like, yeah, but because it's not written for you who have yeah, three kids. it's written for a monk. <laughs> so don't read this part. Like, ask your spiritual father what parts you might read. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's a way that, like, there's been stories, obviously, with the Jesus prayer, and this kind of goes directly into what we're talking about: driving monks insane. You mm -hmm. know, 
it's the same thing because it's not meant, they're not meant to do it. Like you said, it's a medicine, it's a prescription. Everybody, the church is a hospital, Christ is the physician, but we have these spiritual fathers and priests who are, I guess you could consider them like, you know, a therapist or, or another sort of physician who's going to know what you need. And even if it's something you don't think you need, it, it ends up working. Um, God allows things to happen, you know, in yeah, a specific yeah. way. And even there's even some instances where 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 you might know something is that correct, but the fact that you're obedient and you humble yourself yeah. means more in front oh, of yeah. God than you trying to fight with your spiritual father. You know, so oh, it's like yeah. spiritual life is, is 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 so beautiful in that way, right? That even if he is mistaken, but you submit to him, you yeah. it might still end up being the better thing, you know, than if he was right. Yeah, I've had I, a, I've been told not to get any more tattoos. Yeah, and that is a hard one for me. Yeah, but I don't think you have so much more space to to get one. I mean, I do. what are you gonna do on your head? I've got my whole face. Yeah, you know, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's one of the things where I realized maybe he's not even right. Maybe yeah. it doesn't matter. But the fact that I'm not gonna get any more, God sees my obedience. You know, and it's something I struggle with. I mean, that's like a, that's like an all the time thing. Like, oh, I, now that I'm Orthodox, I want to get an Orthodox cross tattoo, or I want to get Archangel Michael on my back or all these things that, you know, in reality could be blasphemous or could be completely sacrilegious, but just me, you know, going, all right, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And being yeah, but that's, but you know, that, that's, that's, that's somehow the process of getting rid of the old man, you know, the passions that, too. Yeah, yeah, but, but but like that can take decades, you know. Why like, else do another? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Deacon. No, I just want to say I think uh, I, uh, I I I forgot. So go up, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, why else? Why else do people get tattoos besides yeah. to be looked at? You know. Yeah. You're I like, mean, oh, there, look at this new there, tattoo I some, got. There's certainly a part of you know it being an art form, and and certainly some tattoos are beautiful, right? But yeah. Again, like you said, why do people get it? You know, yeah. and it, it is certainly to be looked at, to, to somehow to fit in, to identify with a group, right? You know, it could be whatever. It could be so many different things. Uh, so, you know, stay strong with that because that you'll see like you'll lose that, God willing. But then like all of a sudden in 10, 15 years, you just get an idea back in your head because these passions come back. Yeah. Like, and, and they might come back like 10 times harder in 10 years, you know? Because uh, that's the old man. And I think for us who came to the faith in our adulthood, I mean, I was Catholic and converted when I was in my 20s. And for you, a similar situation. Like, yeah. you, 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 you always, there'll always be moments where you will, you, well, you will look back and you will have to fight against the old man, you know? Whatever that passion thing. might be. Yeah, same thing with me being an ex-drug addict. Yeah. It's the same thing. Like, it, you're, you're going to think about it all the time. Yeah. Or you're going to be in a situation where you're like, I, I could do it. I can get one tattoo. I can, yeah. I can do one of these little, this pill, you know, whatever it may yeah. be. And then boom, yeah. you're, you know, yeah. you're back, you're back to the ground or back on the flat earth as, as we were saying yeah. earlier, you know, <laughs> you fall off, you fall off first, the ladder. You have, yeah. I think that's a nice, that's a nice, uh, you know, description, you know, falling off the ladder. Yeah. But which, we will fall off the ladder and you will keep falling off the ladder. Like that's, I think I think that that's something that converts often often miss. You know, they they think that you know they had they they get this special grace on, during baptism or however they're received, and then and then they you know everything is good for a few weeks or even months. You know, some some of these people you know they have this grace filled periods the last months after baptism, right? Yeah, and they think like, oh, now I'm going to read about the uncreated light. I'm going to be a hesychast, and I'm like, I mean, and they you know they can't even make their bed anymore. So it's like, you know. Well, that's, and yeah, then, that's exactly and then, the And then thing. when struggles come, and then when struggles come, they're like, they can't handle it. Because yeah. they already thought about themselves and and, and the, the sorrow they feel from losing. It's not losing, it's healthy for you. But yeah. they think they lose. Like, some of them just leave the faith. I mean, it yeah. happens all the time, you know? Yeah. Sadly. I've had many moments like that. You know, and you will have, and, and I will have, and everyone has, you know, it's, 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 it's something we all share. We're all humans. You know? Well, it's like that idea of, of freedom. Like we don't realize, like we come to the Orthodox church and we think we're getting, we're like, um, getting rid of all these things or we have, we have to like, yeah, we have to get rid of all these things. We don't realize it's actually freedom, you know, like mm. me not getting tattoos anymore is actually a freeing thing because I'm freeing myself from that thought 
from the action, from whatever it may be, you know, that's, yeah. that's real freedom to me. And, and that, and that's Christianity. I mean, Orthodox Christianity, right? that's what Paul spoke about, you know? Yeah. Uh, St. Paul. I mean, and it's, it's, it's really, and, and to the world, it's impossible to understand. And even to us, when we struggle, sometimes it's hard to understand. Um, you know, I, I knew, I know someone who, who, you know, had some passions and he, he just couldn't understand how resisting them is freedom. You know, but then once he managed to resist them and he, he started to commune again and stuff like that, he was like, yeah, now I understand freedom, right? Because yeah. I was a slave to these passions, whatever they were. But in the midst of it, like the world tells us, that's not freedom. Freedom is do whatever you want. Freedom well, yeah, exactly. Is, you know, yeah, that's not like, really freedom. That's being enslaved to your, to your lusts. Yeah. Exactly. That's why ritualism is so important because it's a gift to us versus, versus trying to um, invent ourselves. And, you know, society says, yeah. be whatever you want. And that's why the Orthodox Church and tradition is important and, and completely fundamental because we are only and truly only a full person when we're in communion with God. And in Orthodoxy, we know what our purpose is. We know what it should be. And these traditions and rituals give us, I guess you could say, um, a blueprint you know, a, a look into why, why it's so important. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, humans, uh, we are liturgical beings, you know, someone, yeah. I don't know which father said that or which theologians, I don't remember, but it struck me like that, that's really what it is. You know, we, we are made to worship God and to be in communion with God. And, and we, and we are made to do that together. Obviously you'll have your own relationship with God, but Christ is very clear when he says where yeah. two or three or more gathered, that's where I am, right? So there's this there's this part of, in a way, almost like like the 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 uh, the, the Russian philosophers of the 19th and 20th century spoke about, you know, just completely suppressing the ego, the individual the individual aspect of a hu of a human, right? And to say that today in the West is very it's very hard, uh, but but really sobornos the idea of of Catholicity, right? Yeah. Of, of us being part of something bigger uh that i think that's a christian idea i don't think i don't think the christian idea is i get a tattoo on my on my on my head because yeah. i'm a free individual well, right? deny denying yourself right yes yes it is but it has to be understood, understood correctly because like the quote you wrote people become uh free when they follow the tp code and that's such a radical idea to the world like how do you become free by following of a 700 year old book the typical might be that old. I mean, the Bible is even older, but like, how do you become free? And that's the whole, whole, it's, it's just impossible to explain logically because our faith is super logical, right? It's outside book, of it's any like, logic or any reason. Yes. Yeah. It's like the story, freedom, but, the story you said, yeah. you can like, I don't know if this is true. Well, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's beyond, it doesn't matter. It's beyond that. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think it, it, often today we want to understand these things in a logical way only. Yeah, I think that, and that's when we fail. That's when we make it red pilled, base, whatever they call it. That's when all of a sudden being Orthodox means being a Trump supporter, oh. like like all these things. Like because these people just think about it in an earthly, logical way, right? Yeah, that's that's the thing. And I, I was, I've, I'm sure you've seen my post. I'm very anti-based as of late. Oh yeah, I can't. I mean, someone has to explain that to me because I'm I'm old, ish. Well, it's making it's Orthodoxy like, into a meme. It's oh, making exactly. our faith into a meme. It's not. Have you seen like this? This, this there's this dude online with like this jawline. I don't know if you've seen him. Like the chiseled, like the Chad, the Chad. Yeah, and they like they like put it with like Orthodox Chad. I get it up on YouTube, and yeah. it's like like what are you like? What does he have to do with Nothing. Orthodox? Nothing. Like, and they call it base. And it's like again, I know some of these people. I mean, I love some of these people. It's not it's not a big issue for me, but. But it's like we have to always remember that our faith is really above this world, you know? Yeah. And, and, and is one political side better than the other? Surely. I mean, you know, of course. Guess what's right? even better? We, the royal path. And, exactly. And we shouldn't make that our whole existence, this yeah. political way of living. And, and I think in a, that's what I think I told you one of the shocks in America, um, just moving there now, is, is just how political everything is. Everything. So we have to, we have to reject that. We have to reject that. And even if they say we're political, we have to always say we're not. We're not like I'm yeah. against abortion because it's murder, not because not because Trump says or, it was exactly like, yeah. like that. That's just what it is. You know, I had someone say to me um, in my messages, like, I'm not going to get too deep into it. It wasn't anything too crazy, but they were like, well, Christ, Christ is based. 
And I had to like take a second and breathe. And I was like, how dare you? Mm. Like, how dare you yeah. talk about our God in such like a, in like a, in a using words from TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. You know? that, 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 that's what it is. And that, and, and you know, I, I pray for, for such people because like their heart is in the right place. You know, it, it surely is. Well, they it's found, they found something they, they really believe in. They found something, they found the yeah. truth. And when you find the truth, like we said, again, your pride goes through the roof, you know, like I have the answers. Yeah. It's called convertitis. Like we call it yeah. convertitis. Seraphim Rose, like convert. Seraphim Rose talks about that. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that, that's a dangerous thing. But, but I mean, we've all been through it. I mean, I was a convert, you were a convert, you know? Oh yeah. But I, I, you know, I didn't know what base was back then. Thank God. But, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's this whole TikTok. Yeah. I have a bit of TikTok. I've only read about it. Apparently it's terrible. Yeah, but it's just um, making orthodoxy like everything is a meme now, and orthodoxy should not be a meme. No, no. Yes, and there's like some the soul, there's some funny memes. Sure, I get it. There's some funny oh, orthodox oh, sure. memes. Of course, I love them. They're great. But when you make it the faith yeah. a meme, or you refer to our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings, as based, it's like yeah. he's a lot more than based, my friend. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You wouldn't go. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. walk up to Christ on the cross and say, "This you're so based right now." Like you're so based for hanging here. Yeah, like, not imagine? that's how. That's what I picture when people say it. I'm like, that is not. I would, you know, yeah. fall to my knees and and cry. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you. It's 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 uh, that shouldn't be a part of our of our faith in that way. Right? Yeah, it shouldn't. And then I like how you said real quick um, about being liturgical beings. I think. It made me think about this, and maybe that's why people um, are so obsessed with like sports, right? Oh yeah, I read that somewhere as well from an Orthodox perspective. That's exactly what it is. It's like, like you have you have the cathedral, yes, the colors, yes. the teams, the, colors. the players yeah. are saints yeah. in your eyes. You know, like oh my god, I love yeah, yeah, I love yeah. Mister or whatever. You know, it's like. It's such a westernized. I mean, it's everywhere. I guess you could say, but there's oh, but 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 it's super. It's super uh, clear in the West, like yeah. and not just America, just just like even soccer in Europe. You know, like these these things replace religion. Exactly. And again, like it's fine to watch soccer or football. I I'm not gonna tell someone not to do it, but it's like like I can't watch it because I'll be honest. Like you get aroused and excited like in the wrong way. Like you, it's like. Is you're like burning inside almost because like it's so exciting and yeah. everyone's screaming and and it's like this it means the world to them you know and then that's something to think about like imagine if our faith like if they took one percent of that and put it to our faith you know yeah so definitely it, it's a replacement because we as humans we are drawn to this to this like or like we said sobornos the universe the, the catholicity and and they find it in supporting a team right because they're part of something bigger they, they become like instead of becoming part of the body of Christ, the church, they become part of, you know, yeah, you're like, all fans the Arizona of the Cardinals. same team, right? That's what it is, yeah, that's what it is. You're all wearing like, the same jersey of the same team player, and yeah. you all hate the other person because they yeah. don't they don't agree with you, you know, whatever, whatever it may yeah. be, yeah. So, de definitely, definitely, it's there's something, and I hope someone should write more about that because that's super interesting so but i think i think you had some did you have some questions because i think during your your stream some people asked something oh yeah i, I don't do know how a... i don't know how I don't, I don't know how long i mean i can go on and on i just know you don't like to do much more than an hour well i i do but people people have seen yeah, to, yeah they seem to stop yeah right? okay so my friend who just got married his name's john god bless you john uh many years he said, is there any recommendations on books in English that accurately express the socio-political history of the switch between between Old Right and the Nikonians? So any books that you're aware of or articles that would explain the political... Yeah, I think, I, uh, yeah, I think the book by Mayendorf, Russia Ritual Reform, okay. it does, it's not very political, but it does touch upon it. And it's a good start. And the good thing about that book is it has a good bibliography. So you can find more books there. Sadly, most of them are not in English. Uh, but Rich, Russia Ritual Reform by John Mayendorf um, okay. is, I think, is a good starting point. Generally, even just for yourself to understand the dynamics of the people involved. And from there, you you will be able to find find more books. I think I think. There's probably a lot of secular historians that have written about this that I haven't read so much. So maybe I'll look into it. 
And if I find it, I'll send you. But start with Russian ritual reform and then look even at what he used in his, because that was his doctoral thesis in the early 90s. Sorry, Paul Mayendorf, not John. It's okay. Paul, the Paul son, the son of John. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw that name in this article that I was reading. I saw Mayendorf a few times. Oh, so yeah, as, yeah. As Mayendorf recounts, opposition to the new practices amongst Nikon's firmer fellow zealots led to the covening of the Council of 1654. Yeah. So, yeah, this yeah. article talks about uh, Mayendorf and how, how he dives into yeah, some I, of this stuff. I, I quoted him in my master thesis, and funny enough, he was he was one of the professors for my PhD defense. So he roasted me on my own topic uh, when I did when I defended my PhD. Really? So I'm 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 somehow connected to him uh, through just reading his book and then yeah, being here you go. masters. Russia ritual and reform. Yes, um, and Mayendorf, it's usually very cheap. Mayendorf argues that of all the changes made through the Nikonian reforms, the changing to the wording of the eighth article of the Creed of Nicaea, Constantinople, is, is one of the only alterations that can justifiably be seen as a genuine correction. Russia, Ritual, and Reform, page 178. Yes, yes. So that's, that's so interesting, for, too. Yeah, because we, we, we say the Creed a bit differently. Yeah. We, but that's just one word. We, we call the Holy Spirit... You you would say well, how would you say and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Lord and Giver right? of Life, yeah, and we would Proceeds say the Lord, the Father, yeah, and we would say and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, true in life and Giver of Life. We add true, yeah, I think, um, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it's not a, it's not a, that, again, but he's right that that's probably one of the only things that were real corrections. The other things were just like different traditions that they just forced, forced, um, yeah. So start with that book because I think his bibliography is good. Okay. And then I have a friend, um, his name's John as well, who's a, go a good buddy of mine. He was asking, and this isn't like to convert people, but he was saying, how would you, if someone was inquiring about being old right or an old ritualist, what things would you use, and forgive my, my crassness on this, to convince them? Like if someone was like, I'm thinking about orthodoxy, um, I don't know where to start. I like the old believers. Like, what do you what do you tell them? I mean, the prayer book. I, yeah, the prayer book is a good start, and and just try to explain to them that that this is as monastic as it gets without being in a monastery, and 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 and, and that it's completely fine to admit to yourself that this is perhaps not for you. Yeah. Like, I would probably just start from that perspective. Like, you know what? Like, don't think you have to do this to be orthodox. This is blessed by the church. This is in the church. This is obviously, you know, you can you can commune, you can all of that. But it is a very specific thing, and 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 it is it's not for everyone. So you, you know? can pre that, preface with this might not be for you, but the, if you're interested, but, but if you're interested in in, in you know in going in in in, in, pr in pr if you're interested in prayer that is done according to very strict rules and according to to following the tipicon. Then yeah, consider the old right. Uh, but again, all that depends where you're at. Because in America, yeah. again, one or one and a half, two parishes, and they're all like in Erie, Pennsylvania. You know, like like that's why I always tell people get the prayer book and do some of these things by yourself. And for most people, that will be enough. You know, like you don't have yeah. to call yourself an old ritualist. You don't gotta like this book was used by all the saints in Russia. You know, before 1665. Like it's 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 a blessed book. It's a beautiful book. These prayers and, and, and this order and everything is beautiful. And for most people, that will probably be enough. So, you know, um, maybe that's this is not a good defense of the old right. You know, I, no, just... no, it, no, I think it makes sense. It's, it's not, I mean, orthodoxy is for everybody, but some people don't have the discipline uh, to follow it. And especially the old right, it's, it's a lot more. I mean, that's why... I, I just think it. Go on, sorry. That's why sorry. people aren't called to be monks, not all people. Yeah, no. And I, I you know, and, and I just really want to emphasize the most important thing is that you become orthodox yeah you know sure does the oca sometimes do well, things we don't orthodox agree with? that is in <laughs> communion i mean of course not yeah but for not not but for me coptic no 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 but for me orthodox that that's what i'm thinking about you know yeah. i don't i wouldn't call them just orthodox yeah if they're if they're in the room i would say oriental orthodox if yeah. you and me are talking i would use a different word right yeah <laughs> uh, 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 so so definitely and so would they the right you know <laughs> yes, and I think the most important thing is is, is your Orthodox faith, and don't allow ritual uh, to become your main focus from the get go. You know, 
yeah. but on the other hand, in the old right, when you go to these services and you go to the full vigil, like that's that's your catechesis. That's your like you hear these hymns, like for the elevation of the cross, like mm-hmm. you know the whole theology there. And you don't gotta you, you don't have to read a single book. If you if you would if we would all attend these services, which none of us does. That's I mean, that's has... exactly what we were saying. It goes back to just they didn't have to read any books to be orthodox. No, 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 because you 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 know just listen. I mean, just listen to the the the, the best example is just the, the hymns we sing on Pascha. You know, you yeah. know, Christ is risen from the dead, trembling now death by death. Like Done. he's risen from the dead. He killed death by death. Like you don't need more. Like that's no. your faith. You know. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have a PhD or you're a farmer. Like you understand your faith. And that's that's what orthodoxy always was and is and should be compared to the Western Christianities. It's exactly this thing that in our services, that's where you find our theology. Yeah, that's where you find like these hymns written in the eighth century. Every that's... every week. Exactly every day. If you every day if you're yeah. in a monastery and they're serious, you have for every saint you have a trapari, a kodaka that explains the life of that saint, and you just go to that service, and afterwards you're like, that saint died because he didn't want to bow down to an idol. Like, yeah, cool. Yeah, and you just <laughs> you won't you, you won't have to read a book. You know? Yeah. And then um, I know this is very brief. How did the old right church handle the pandemic? I don't know what that was. Like, what happened? So, uh, <laughs> they didn't, <laughs> it yeah. wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a thing. No, I mean, it was, it, it, uh, and this is not, not discounting. I want people to know we're not discounting that people, people no. died. It was a oh, real, yeah. it was a real thing, Yes, but it, it happened. The church, it happened. The church it, should not close because of it. No. And to my knowledge, from what I know and from what I experienced, uh, none of that happened among the old ritualists. Uh, I, I even know stories of the opposite in some states uh, where there are some people who are all believers, not canonical. You know, they would they would have some techniques to fool the cops, even you know, yeah. you know, park park their cars four blocks from the church, walk to the church, and do and do Pascha without without candles or candles yeah. or lights, so that no one would know that they're there. You know, so I don't well, have to even say where in my was, jurisdiction. But, yeah, I mean, even in my jurisdiction, in certain places. Uh, I'm not going to like out anybody, but it, no. it, it, it wasn't a thing either. No, no. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. Yeah. No, no. And I think, and I think that, 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 you know, that, that's enough said. I mean, I think that, uh, I know that some people generally in the church were put in very difficult situations with the authorities, you know, in some States and some countries, and I'm not, I'm not condemning them for whatever yeah. they did, but to my knowledge within the uh, old ritualists, uh, that I know of and that I experienced personally, nothing, it didn't affect anything. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Do we have, but, I don't, but, but, I, but, but, but I don't know everything. So like if, yeah. if someone finds something like in Siberia, they close the church, like don't, you know, don't, don't kill me. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm sure they did it. Well, Deacon Philip, thank you. I think we touched on a lot of good stuff today. I really do. And I know thank I you. could, I could keep going, but that gives us an opportunity for, for next time and, and maybe if anybody has any questions or comments if you have anything that we can talk about that isn't necessarily the old right because you know people are interested in this and we'll do them when they come about but um there's a lot of other things that we can that we can touch on yeah and i think and i think it's important to 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 to, to touch on other things as well right yeah. uh, b- because like i think just by by doing only this it seems like we're emphasizing it and it's like, yeah it's, yeah, it's beautiful, but but at the end of the day, I'm Orthodox. At the end exactly. of the day, I, I pray for the same patriarch as any other Russian Orthodox in the world. Like, it's not, you know, we're not that different. We're not different. I mean, yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not here trying to convert yeah. people to being an old right. No, I'm here for people I, to find Orthodoxy. Exactly. I'm not I'm not here to convert people to the old right. And, well, and good luck finding a parish should, anyway. That, that's the thing, right? Like, I might, I might tell you, like, some of the cool things we do in our piety that might help you. Uh, but you find that among serious Greeks, among serious uh, Serbs, Russians, Romanians, Bulgarians, yeah. like it's not, it's really not, not a big deal. So somehow, you know, uh, I just like, I want to reemphasize that because, because like, it's the same on my channel and on my Instagram. And it's like, whenever I pop that, that two famous words, old believers, like boom, it explodes. Everyone wants to know everything. I'm like, that's wonderful. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's about, it's about, at the end of the day, it's, it's just about love. You yeah. know, God is love. 
and 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 and, and really that's my conclusion <laughs> that God well, I'll, is ma- I'll make sure to title this video do not become an old believer <laughs> you could i mean no. i wouldn't mind <laughs> no clickbait because then people are going to know it's people are going to know it's the opposite you know they're going to be like, yeah that's how the internet works yeah no no be, become a christian you know become a yeah. by, by christian i mean orthodox christian yeah. right so yeah. become that you know that's what you should become and, and not a based one just a real one yeah not based okay well we didn't start with a prayer so i'm going to end with a prayer um and then uh do it from our book you, i'm do doing the, it right do now the, from your book do the uh yeah do whatever you want from our book because that english is i like that english okay we'll start with a we'll end with a prayer uh, maybe I'll throw it at the beginning. I don't know. It doesn't It doesn't really matter. We're being prayerful about this. That's all that matters, like we've said. All right. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Heavenly King, Comforter, true Spirit, who art everywhere and fillest all, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell within us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. I, I love, I do love the prayer, the prayer book. I really do. We could have done a, a 30-minute one just now. But. Yeah, but you added both. We don't say both. So I don't know where you read that. I'm sorry, I got to tease you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever. Yeah, and the two ages, the ages. I guess yeah, I, just, I guess I'm just so used to seeing both. I know. <laughs> it does not say I, both. <laughs> no, because it's it's just a funny thing because I don't know any other prayer book in English. Like I don't pray in English. When I yeah. pray in English, I use that one. So for me, every time it's different. I'm like, what 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 was that? You can catch you know? it because yeah, because I don't even want to catch it. But like, if you, if you only know one version, well, I, I guess for it, me it was like. I'm reading glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. But since I know the prayer in my own tradition, small t, I just yeah, continue exactly. with both yeah. now and ever. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, forever and ever. Amen. Always. Yes. Yeah. So glory to God. Thank you, uh, Deacon Philip. Thank you for being here. Thank um, you for having me. I'll link all your stuff again in the description. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, check out our recent video, become a Patreon member for, um, for Death of the World, Orthodox Logos. And Deacon Philip, we're going to send you some stuff. So I do need your. Oh your address Thank off you. air so that people don't send you anthra- anthrax or anything weird. What's well, anthrax? It's like, it's, medicine? Like when, it's like when you open the letter and then you die. Oh, okay. Well, that must be an American thing. I've never it heard must of. be. It's pretty based. <laughs> oh, and red pill, right? Yeah, it's red pill, literally. All right, Deacon Philip, thank you so much, and um, God bless Thank you. And, you me. and I hope you I hope you feel better. I know you have a little bit of a cold again, just so people know. He's, yeah. You know. yeah. But, I think, but I think this one's better than the last one, so I hope you understood me. But the I last hope one, that the, the last one was video... monkeypox, right? No, <laughs> stop. <laughs> so, someone will take it and then cut it and be saying, yes, it was. No, no, no. <laughs> nobody here has monkeypox, okay? We don't attend yeah. certain events. No, no, we do not. Well, we God bless, Deacon, not. and um, we'll do another Thank one you. soon. God bless you.